screen. So we're assuming the sound is working. Um, this is a very short sheet for a couple of reasons I'd like to think about exploring. Um, so tonight's topic is the beauty or the power of the cross. Um, I use those words interchangeably, um, and they are not. They're two different words. But um, my own reflection and prayer with them. Um, but the goal for tonight is to talk about the beauty of the cross and how important it is to our faith. I do understand the irony of doing this during Stations of the Cross. Um, I understand that it is ironic that we're talking about the cross while our brothers and sisters of the parish are doing the liturgical tradition um, of Stations. Um, Father Joseph was very kind to cover for me um, so I could be here. And with the theology of the cross, um, the beauty of the cross is not just an idea or theory. It is a reality to the Christian life. Um, to live in the belief of Jesus Christ is to live in the truth and love that implies daily sacrifice, implies suffering. Christianity is not an easy road. Um, it is a difficult climb, but one that is illuminated by the light of Christ and by the great hope that is born in him. Um, the Paschal mystery of Christ's cross and resurrection stands at the center of the good news that the apostles and the church proclaim. Um, and so the goal for this evening, and we will see as we move together as a community, um, I'd like to talk about the cross um, in the lens of both Paul and John. Um, there's obviously a lot you can talk about in the cross and a lot of its theology, um, but I find Paul's core reality an emphasis of the cross. Um, and then John, um, let me take a step back. So Paul, in his theology, and I'll go deeper into it, the cruci crucifixion of Christ is the very basis of Paul's theology and preaching. That is how be Paul begins his theology. That is how Paul introduces who he is. Um, and so we will talk about that part of Paul as the kerygma, um, is where we'll start in a few moments. And with John, John's unique understanding of the passion and the crucifixion as both the glory of God and the lifting up of Christ and the birthplace of the church. Um, the crucifixion and the passion in John's gospel, the pouring of the blood and water from the side of Christ is the birth of Christ. And so I'll give us um, if we want some opportunity maybe to read a little bit from the scriptures themselves. Um, and there's a lot of options with Paul. Um, and so I list it in your sheet, I hope I didn't cut that out, of different opportunities. Um, both in Paul's own words in his letters. Um, the letters to the Corinthians, Romans, uh, Philippians, but then also in Acts of the Apostles. right, um, Where the kerygma really is the center um, and Paul has three great discourses um, in Acts where the crucifixion takes the center place. Um, um, and also for Paul, and I'll get into it deeper, but the crucifixion reveals to us the very nature of God. Um, and it is an important reality that must be accepted. Right? Um, in your key words, there are two. But first, the kerygma is the proclamation of the good news, which is that Christ crucified and died and is risen, and through him we are reconciled with God. So kerygma is the Greek word that means um, proclaimed, um, and it means the very root of the gospel. Um, that word is still used in tradition. Um, there's a whole section of Evangelia Gaudium by Pope Francis which talks about what is the kerygma and how do we proclaim it. Um, and so, and so it's through this understanding of the resurrection and redemption that we can have a better understanding of who Christ is. Um, and so for Paul, everything centered around Christ. Um, Paul is a unique gift to the church for a lot of reasons. One of them is his letters are really the earliest writings that we have that explain how Christians were and operated. So 1 Corinthians 
E is arguably the earliest Christian document that we have. Um, it is earlier in histor historicity than the Gospels. So yes, I understand that the Gospels talk about events that predate Paul and predate Paul's conversions, but his letters were written earlier. They're writing at the very initial, and so you'll things, hear things in Paul's letters, things like the Philippians passage, which I reference, um, are considered and thought to be hymns, things that were said by all Christian communities. So not everything that Paul writes is unique to Paul. He articulates what is the Christian belief of Christians in the 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, and so he is our very first encounter. Um, and then the uniqueness with Romans, um, which many talk about Paul's um, most theologically complex letter, is in part because Paul has never met the Romans. So when we read the, Paul's letters, um, those are all communities or people that Paul knows, right? And when we read Acts, we hear Paul visiting the Cor Corinth and Thessalonica. We hear him traveling with Timothy and Titus. Right? The way that I speak to people I have met, I write to them, you know who I am. Right? The way I would talk to you now is different than if I was first showing up to the parish. Romans um, is arguably Paul's last letter and is writing to a community. It's his writing note in advance. Hi, I am coming. This is what I believe. This is what the church teaches. This is proof that I am an apostle taught by Christ himself. Because remember, Paul's witness is rooted in his own encounter of the resurrected Lord. Christ could not have resurrected if he had not been crucified. Right? There is no resurrection without the crucifixion. Right? It is fundamental to Paul and to his own witness as an apostle. Um, as he says in 1 Corinthians 2, um, this is so he's talking to the Corinthians and reminding them, when I came to you, brothers, proclaiming the mystery of God, I did not come with the sublimity of words or of wisdom, for I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Right. So Greek letters, there's an introductory passage, and then now he's getting into the letter itself. Like, you knew me, you know I did not trick you with logic or signs, but I preached to you this scandal of the cross. I preached to you something that revealed the very nature of who Jesus Christ is. Um, his encounter with Jesus and the central significance of the cross made clear to him that he understood that Christ had died and rose for all and for himself. Both of these things are important. Um, they are both universal and subjective. Um, for, the cry, for the cross, Christ died for all people. That's the universal understanding. And where Paul is a Jew, but also a well-spoken Roman. He preached to the Gentiles. He preached to mixed communities. So when he talks about the crucifixion for all, it's this universal idea. But for Paul and for all of us, it should be a very personal reality. It should be subjective. That Christ died for each one of you personally. And that is a difficult tension to have. Um, each one of us, it can often be easier to say, yes, Jesus Christ died for all people. To say all people is a distancing language. It separates you from the gruesomeness that is the cross. It separates you from the gruesomeness of the passion. Right? He died for all people. And yet the church has been clear that it was not the Jews that crucified Jesus or the Romans, but each one of us through our sins and our failures. But what does that mean, the subject to reality that Jesus Christ died for each one of you? It's a reflection of his love for you. It is not that he suffered for no reason, but out of love for each one of you. By giving up his own son for our sins, God manifests that his plan for us is one of benevolent love prior to any merit on our part which is a key understanding, 
any merit of our part. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the expiation for our sins. God shows us His love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He gave us His love freely and without cost. All were saved. We are called to model ourselves on this reality of sacrifice. For Paul, the cross has a fundamental primacy in the history of humanity. It represents the focal point of his theology. Because to say cross is to say salvation. As grace is given to every creature. The topic of the cross of Christ becomes an essential and primary element of the apostles' preaching. Because Christ died for all people and for you. This tension that exists to acknowledge that Christ died for every one of us, but that means he also died for us out of love for each one of you. And a love that is not merited, it is not earned. I know we are often accused of having to earn our salvation but out of love for you, a love that we cannot pay back, but you are called to do so in how we live. Um, Paul frequently talks about the folly of the cross. Why would we worship someone who had died? How could a God be killed? How could God be a man who could die? These are all questions that Paul is confronted with. Paul who preaches to Romans, to Greeks, to Jews, to everyone. Christ preaches Christ crucified because it is essential to understand the very nature of God. That he became a man. That he died for each one of you out of love. That he suffered. Right? That he is not this glorified being that floats down and is all powerful and as a in a clockwork. It is a man that was in relationship with you, and that loved you so much that he's willing to die, to take on this suffering, this pain. We do not believe in a God that distanced himself from us, but who constantly seeks us out. Paul, who was steeped in covenantal theology, right? Paul is a Pharisee, is a Jew who understands deeply the Old Testament. God's constant seeking out to us that is fulfilled in its fullness in Jesus Christ. And so the crucifixion is necessary to understand what does the incarnation mean. Now three of the most important dimensions of this death that need to be constantly recalled. One, that Jesus' death on the cross reveals his own faithful obedience to God in his love for humanity, as well as the faithfulness, love, and restorative justice and the paradoxical power of God. Two, as Messiah, Jesus dies as the faithful, obedient representative of Israel, of God's covenantal people, and as representative of all people, serving as the new Adam. His death for us and for sins is quintessentially covenantal Jewish and a human act of faith toward God and love towards others. The sinless one becomes sin. And finally, this death is an act of both God and God's Messiah brings about human reconciliation with God, the forgiveness for sins and the redemption for sins. To understand um, the importance of the crucifixion in Pauline theology, we have to understand justification, the necessity of the cross. Justification has two aspects. Moved by grace, 
man turns toward God and away from sin and so accepts forgiveness and righteousness from on high. I should start with justification has been merited for us by the passion of Christ. It is granted to us through baptism. It conforms us to the righteousness of God who justifies us. It has for its goal the glory of God and of Christ and the gift of eternal life. It is the most excellent work of God's mercy. And justification includes the remission of sins, sanctification, and the renewal of the inner man. Paul's theology emphasizes it is only through Christ's sacrifice that we are able to receive the grace of God in eternal life. Um, I'd like us, if you guys are interested, um, to just read um, one of the passages that Paul preaches about the crucifixion. Um, either in Acts, preferably in Acts, where we hear Paul talk to one of the crowds. Um, some are longer than others. Um, I don't have a preference, um, but there are three instances. Um, or if you'd like to read um, the Philippians 2 passage um, or Romans 5. There are a lot of options, or Romans 8 for that matter. Um, do we have a preference on whether or not we'd like to read Romans, Philippians, or Acts? We want to do Acts? All right, there are three options. Do we want the longest, the middle, or the shortest? That's the middle. Do I have a volunteer? There's more than one Bible, don't worry. Acts 17, 22 to 31. It is Paul preaching at the Areopagus. Areopagus. You can say it however you want. It's a Greek word. It's a Greek place. And, and I won't judge you. Can't vouch for anybody else, but I will not judge you. Yeah. Are you reading it? No, no, we all assumed you were going to read it. Or stone by human art 
and imagination. God has overlooked the times of ignorance, but now he demands that all people everywhere repent because he has established a day on which he will judge the world with justice through a man he has appointed. And he has proved and he has provided confirmation for all by raising him from the dead. That's Paul talking about the universal call to repent and believe in the gospel. Um, but justification is one of those things that over the years has caused a lot of division within the Christian community. Time out, Deacon. Um, we can take a break now and ask questions about Paul, or do we want to talk about John first? and then come back and talk about the presentation as a whole. Um, before, because I know sometimes when we dive into stuff, we may not get back to it, which is fine with me. You guys are driving the train of the presentation. Um, John is a much shorter section, um, but I don't have a huge preference. Okay, so there are a couple of important parts of John um, first, just a basic overview of the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is broken up into two sections, more or less by scholars. The first section is known as the Book of Signs, um, and it is Christ's miracles and witnesses. Um, it begins really in John 2 with the wedding at Cana. It's considered the first sign, and there are seven major signs in the Book of Signs. Um, the Book of Glory is chapters 13 through 21, and it is Christ's journey towards his passion, death, and resurrection. Um, in the book of glory, Jesus is aware that the hour has come for him to pass from this world to the Father, showing to the very end his love for his own who were in this world. So the book of glory, the emphasis is Christ knows the necessity of his death and resurrection, and that it is in that passion that God is glorified. Um, now there's a unique um, theological discussion, we'll call it, um, about, let me finish this idea of glory first, and then we'll talk about the birth of the church. Um, the death of Jesus on the cross is his glorification and return to the Father. Um, John Loves plays on words in his gospel. And so it talks about Christ being lifted up on the cross. Some scholars talk about how it's a double meaning. Literally being lifted up, right? A cross is above the earth. But it also is in reference to him being lifted up to the Father um, through his death. Um, that Jesus is both physically elevated from the earth at his crucifixion, but at the same time is being exalted and glorified. Um, in John... Jesus' final words are, it is completed. It is completed, meaning this has been the goal and the end of his mission. Um, and that the Spirit is leaving him. Um, and that he, in that moment, is the perfect paschal sacrifice. right? Which connects directly to the fact that he will soon be stabbed with a spear. His side will be pierced. And in that piercing... There is discussion of, is that the birth of the church? Um, the church is born primarily of Christ's total self-giving for our salvation, anticipated in the institution of the Eucharist and fulfilled on the cross. The origin and growth of the church are symbolized by the blood and water which flowed from the open side of the crucified Jesus, which appears in the Gospel of John witnessed by two of his disciples, his mother and the beloved disciple who we presume to be John, who, then, who reflect what it means to be a disciple of Christ. John's gospel is unique in that there are witnesses at the foot, the women, Mary, 
and the beloved disciple. And the other Gospels, a witness from a distance. In John's, they are there. They are present. Um, that it is from the side of Christ that the wondrous sacrament of the whole world that the church was born from the pierced heart of, the, of Christ hanging dead on the cross. Um, there are two theological strains that are in tension with one another. Um, the blood of the cross and the sacrifice of Christ is the foundation of the church. And then also again in Acts 2 with the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost. Um, these two moments are both the birth of the church in their own ways. But these two figures, who are never given names, um, they bring them into the mother-son relationship and constitute a community of disciples, the community that preserved John's gospel and demonstrate for us the call to discipleship even when it is difficult and it is painful when you witness suffering and suffer yourselves. And so for us, what does that mean? One, as Paul reminds us, that the gospel is quintessential. The kerygma is the passion and death and crucifixion of Christ and his resurrection for us. It is through that suffering and death that it reveals that God loves us till the end. It reveals to us that there is a call to suffer as Christians, a call to sacrifice, that the work we, that we do does not merit our salvation. We do not earn it. But by, do, by doing so, we participate with Christ in that one sacrifice. Um, that we do it out of gratitude and out of love. Um, and it reminds us that there is an intimate connection between church and salvation. That the church was formed in the moment of our salvation, at the moment of crucifixion. Um, and it reminds us of the obligation to encourage one another um, as a community. And so that is really all that I have. Um, I am open for questions or thoughts or sharing, please. I have no desire to be any center of attention. Um, and if you'd like, we have the opportunity, if you want, we can read from John 19, which is the passion, part, passion narrative. Um, but it is up to you as a community. And if you find it helpful... John 19. I think you're doing it since you volunteered. No, no. Um, if you want to start with the blood and water, that's 1931. If you want to start with the crucifixion, that is 17. Um, and just some beautiful imagery as they talk about the exaltation of Christ, um, the undivided garments. They talk about how that is kingly imagery and priestly imagery, both the sacrifice and the beautiful garments. But it's 19. If you want to do crucifixion, it starts at the end of 16 um, into 17. Well, we're going to have to practice using our Bibles. It's page 1164 in mine. All right, so it's 19, very end of the first column. See, different Bibles. Yes, 19, end of 16, beginning of 17. It starts the crucifixion. He went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the midst. Pilate also had an inscription written and said, 
put on the cross, it read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read the inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. But Pilate said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his cloth and divided them into four shares, a share for each soldier. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, Let's not carry, but cast lots for it to see who it, who it will be, in order that the passage of Scripture might be fulfilled. That said, they divided my garments among them, and from my vesture they cast lots. They, this is what the soldiers did, standing by the cross of Jesus, where his mother and his and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After being aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. There was a vessel filled with common wine, so they put a sponge, soaked in wine, on a spring of hyssop, and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he handed over the spirit. You want to keep going just until the end of 37 because that's the blood in the water okay. and the foundation of the, the church blood and the water. now since it was preparation day in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the sabbath for the sabbath day of that week was a solemn one the jews passed pilate that their legs be broken and they be taken down so the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage said, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. So when he when he gives his mother to the disciple that he loved, and he said he's taking the first John, is that the same John? Yes. So the question is, who is the beloved disciple? Um, so there are lots of theories, thoughts. Um, the common scholastic idea is that John and Mary, so John the Apostle, um, the author of the fourth gospel, um, lived with Mary in the city of Ephesus. Um, and so that they lived together and founded the community um, that helped to write what is the gospel of John, which is not necessarily the same author of Revelation and the first three letters of John. The tradition has, they're all the same. Um, 
but that John writes and does not give a name in part is a literary device, some would say out of humility, um, but also for each one of us to place ourselves in that moment. To place yourself, to understand that the sacrifice on the cross is for each one of you individually. Um, John, throughout his gospel, will use unnamed people to allow you, because he's writing it knowing that it's going to be read, um, to allow you, the reader, to place yourself in that moment in prayer, in encounter with the Spirit, to understand that Christ died for you individually. Um, and so it's thought that it's John, the writer, um, done intentionally um, to help you as the reader to enter into that moment more deeply. That is not mine. That is from a jo John scholar. Um, none of my ideas are original, I promise. Yeah. Because I always wondered, I'm like, if it's him, why not say, like, I was saying it? <laughs> you know? Right. Um, and it would have it's presumed that those that first read it would have known who it was. Um, that they would have, so the, they call it the Joanine community, community of beloved disciple. Um, it is one of Raymond Brown's big ideas that he talks a great deal about. Um, but that they would have known it in Ephesus that he was John the Apostle. Um, that when he's writing it, they know who he's talking about, that he's an eyewitness to it. But it's to allow everybody to enter into it more deeply. Um, John is also the writer that would have that taught Ignatius of Antioch and Polycarp. Um, St. Irenaeus, if you hear about him, he's a pretty prominent, and the rumor has it, he's going to be our next doctor of the church, um, was taught by Polycarp, I believe. So John is only, Irenaeus is two generations away from John. Exactly. And that, that, that makes, that just brings everything together. Yeah, I can't put it any better. Justification. Before we do that, just one side note um, that I forgot to mention. Um, John's Gospel does not have Simon of Cyrene. Um, and with an intentional idea of understanding that Christ is choosing this death um, to exalt God, that he's approaching this as a kingly figure and a priest figure, um, that he is the Paschal Lamb and the sacrifice, and that he's approaching it, um, right, that le rather than it being imposed that, that this is part John is clear that this is part of God's plan and that he is carrying the cross himself um, and so it's a tangential it's related yeah to what you're sharing but sorry Deacon I cut you off earlier Mm -hmm. um, can you explain how they think of justification as opposed to what we should think of 
I can do my best. Um, some of it has to do with, and I was just talking to um, somebody about this. It has to do in somewhat like their understanding of anthropology um, and the role of grace. So meaning, how do we view the human person? Um, so I'll take my favorite image, because I like vivid imagery, because that helps me to picture and connect, um, to understand Luther um, and how he understands the relationship between God and grace and man. Um, and Deacon's sm smiling because this is a favorite of everyone's. Is Martin Luther said, man is dung. Um, he uses worse language, um, but I am not because I'm being recorded. Um, he said, man is dung and that God's grace is snow being placed on top of it, covering it so that it cannot be seen anymore. Now, you can see that that has a very negative understanding of who is the human person um, versus our understanding of grace and justification. Not that we can merit our own salvation, but the call to participate in that relationship, um, the call to live a life of sacrifice, to unite our own sacrifice and suffering to Christ's own on the cross. Um, and so it's a fine line to walk um, that we are not meriting. Um, and so that's why if the justification section, I explicitly pulled from the catechism. Um, that way I cannot be accused of being secretly a Protestant. Um, it was a running g gag amongst some of my friends because I grew up in North Florida, which is heavily Protestant. In Jacksonville, I had more Baptist friends than I did Catholic. Um, Versus my friends from South Florida, um, or even Tampa, Orlando, who's much more Catholic. Um, and so, um, but so that's really, it's that understanding of sacramental grace. Um, so it's versus, think of that Luther image of snow being poured upon dung, versus Aquinas, who advocates that grace builds on nature. That it's our call to participate and work with this nature to help us to grow. That is what um, sacramental grace is. Um, that's what the sacraments are meant to do, is help us to respond to God's call. That there's a participation in it that many of our brothers and sisters do not have. Um, if you want like Protestant bu buzzwords, things like total depravity um, is one of them. That, like our conscience is so obscured that we cannot respond. Um, versus we do not hold that belief. Um, the scripture passage that the Lord um, said, be perfect as thy heavenly Father is perfect, mm -hmm. comes to mind in terms of that God is calling us to be holy. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that holiness and that we he wouldn't call us to be holy unless we believe that we, you know, mm -hmm. that we could be holy. Um, and that means that we're not, you know, that, that we are to work, mm -hmm. to constantly be working towards that call, striving throughout our life, um, so that we're not just like depraved people and not just like a piece of dung. Um, as you know, Luther was saying, you know, I, I kind of reflected upon that in the past, um, but that's, um, is that, is that making sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's a deeper reminder that um, all that God creates is one good, and two, that we're creating God's image and likeness, to hold fast to that reality. Um, and it's through baptism, right? So like the pa passage in justification talks about through baptism, we have access to Christ's passion, death, and suffering. It's through that, baptism is the response to original sin. Um, that is what cleanses us and gives us that grace with which we can seek that perfection. Because we were, um, I can't remember what Cardinal Burke was saying one time, um, original sin distorted the soul. Holiness through this call of holiness through baptism, um, God then then 
feels is that the, the mm -hmm. soul is brought back into the image of I mean it's um restored. Mm -hmm. It's restored from that original sin. Um and that distortion, so to speak, is like Yeah, I mean concupiscent concubinance the stain of the word I, I think the church uses more often than not is stain. Okay. Um, distortion might be another word it uses. Uh, um, I know stain of original sin is often used to reflect even still our inclinations at times to choose that which is not good. Um, the baptism gives us that fighting chance, that access to life, because we are separated from God through sin. So baptism is that response and that re reuniting us with God, giving us access um, to God's grace. All right, so um, the language I use um, when I talk to the RCA candidates that baptism is the gateway sacrament. It's the access to all other things. Um, and God can do all things, but baptism is the gateway into relationship with God. Right. You know, like, yeah. What's it all about, Alfie? You know, it's like you gotta enter into the house full, you know, in order to mm -hmm. really experience the beauty of that house. Mm -hmm. uh, and the beauty of the Christ. Right, and that's right. Grace builds on nature, it doesn't force nature. Which is different. Those are two different things. Like God will never force us to do anything. Grace is there to assist and encourage us. Amen. Anything else that y'all would like to share? Thank you all for coming. Um, I invite you, if you have the chance, um, the rumor has it after stations, our pastor will re-expose the Lord. Um, that's the plan. Um, I was not there last week. But that's what you told me the plan is. Um, so I'll invite you all to, yeah, go spend some time with the Lord. Before we end, I had one other thing I wanted to share. All right, well, I'm going to turn off the live stream because they can't hear you either way. <laughs>